Preview and prediction time. Ohio State and Maryland. One more game for the Buckeyes before they go into the bye. Can they win a fourth in a row against a team that they have beaten every time they've played them in their brief series history? But I think you could make the accurate statement that this uh, this Maryland team has more talent coming into this game than they've had at any point in their series history prior. The Buckeyes coming back home for their Big Ten home opener. We'll see if they can keep things rolling. Here's what you need to watch for and what we think is going to happen. It's Ohio State and Maryland preview and prediction coming up next. Buckeye Breakdown. We've got the whole crew together as we cover Ohio State with our instant analysis from Ohio State. There's something that doesn't feel right. Unbelievable effort from him today. Is EJ Liddell going to crack the first team all Big Ten? I think he can be the guy. I'm not trying to start a quarterback controversy. He seems to have the durability. He certainly has the toughness. This is the question on a lot of people's minds here. Welcome to Buckeye Breakdown. What's going on? Welcome back to Buckeye Breakdown. Alongside our coach, Tommy Zagorski, I'm Brendan Gulick. We are really, really excited for this week's game against a Maryland team that, you know, if they weren't coming in off of, I don't want to call it stubbing your toe, because I don't think that merely talks about how hard they stubbed their toe last week uh, in throwing seven interceptions. If they weren't coming off that game, I feel like the buildup for this game might be a little bit different. Instead, it's Ohio State and Maryland, a Maryland team that offensively is still a top 25 team in the country, uh, although they did lose their top offensive receiver in uh, Dante Demas this week. They still have some talent, uh, and they still think they can give the Buckeyes a pretty good uh, pretty good contest on Saturday night. Coach, I, I know you're excited about this. We've talked about it a little bit off the air. Why don't we just start with maybe the, the thing you're most looking forward to watching? Most likely thing I'm looking forward to is to see if the Buckeyes can continue to stress this Maryland offense. You know, they've got a veteran quarterback now who really, you know, he's been there, you know, for a couple of years. He struggled last of the week, you know, throwing six interceptions, six of the seven interceptions. He had a tough, tough day. And he's going to have to find his new receiver. You know, the biggest thing is you're used to having a receiver that you can trust, that you know you can go to, you know, down in and down out. You know, Daryl Jones, Jay Sean Jones, um, and, and these guys are really going to have to step up. Um, Rakeem Jarrett has shown that he's a really special player. He's a big five-star guy that Mike Loxley and his staff were excited to get. And, you know, really, they're going to try to attack the Buckeyes early. We talked about this last week, starting fast against Rutgers. I hate to be a broken record, Brendan, but we need the Buckeyes to start fast again and leave, take that doubt that's in the heart of these Maryland Terrapins out of it very early because that's what they're still feeling. You alluded to it as a, a stubbing of a toe. Uh, it was more like an amputation, uh, what they tra what transpired. Um, on you know, on last week against the Iowa Hawkeyes. So for them to go forward and really have an opportunity in this, they're going to need to score fast. They're going to need to score quick. They're going to need to couple have a couple a couple stops against the Buckeyes and give themselves an opportunity to really have the chance to hang in this game. Because talent wise, Maryland's gotten vastly better. They're still not the Buckeyes, without question. Uh, you know, you brought up Rakeem Jarrett's name. Uh, 38 catches, 528 yards, and six touchdowns over his first nine career games as a Terrapin. You know, he, he was uh, he was pretty highly recruited. He was a five-star kid out of high school, had offers from just about everywhere. Uh, and now all of a sudden he's finding himself playing in an extremely meaningful role. You know, the, the reality is since the beginning of the 2020 season, just in terms of raw statistics – Talia Tungavailoa is one of the most accomplished quarterbacks in Division I in now basically the last year and a half. He's averaging almost 300 throwing yards per game. He's at like uh, 287. Oh, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. 278. 78, yeah. Um, you know, uh, he's obviously got some escapability. Um, you know, they've been putting up some pretty good offensive numbers until last week. Some of that might have been the level of competition. They, they beat up on Kent State uh, and, and hung 62 on Howard. Um, but I still think they've got a decent offense, and I expect them to move the ball a little bit. I agree with you. I don't think they're going to keep up with Ohio State. I don't think they're going to really threaten to win this game. But I, I think they're a very competent Big Ten offense that you better take seriously or it's going to make for a frustrating day. It is. I mean, you know, Talia Tagovailoa, um, is is one of the you know one of the great players in college football, and if he didn't have the uh, the what happened and transpired last week, 
we're talking about this guy as potentially the second best quarterback, you know, in the Big Ten next to CJ Stroud, depending on if you're a Buckeye fan or not, if you're a CJ fan or not. That's where we're going to have that conversation. They're led by Dan Enos. And, and one of the things that I think people forget, Dan Enos was a great head football coach at Central Michigan. He went on to be a coordinator at Arkansas. So he left Central Michigan to be a coordinator at Arkansas. The reason I tell you this history lesson is this. Dan Enos, when I was coaching at the University of Tennessee, coached against us in 2015. Brett Bilema was the uh, the head coach there, but Dan was the offensive coordinator. Dan knew that the Arkansas offense was not going to be able to keep up with Tennessee's offense, with the, the firepower we had. So what did they do? They slowed the game down. They decided they were going to run the football. They were going to eat the clock up. I literally remember sitting in the press box at Neyland Stadium and watching Arkansas go on an 11-minute drive. Not play, minute drive. It took the energy out of the stadium, and we had to fight tooth and nail, uh, you know, for that game. And and unfortunately, that night Arkansas came away victorious. They're not better. Uh, they were not better than the Tennessee Volunteers. I am not paralleling these two teams in that regard. But Dan Enos does know how to control the game, how to control the clock. He's not going to be able to do it with pounding the football like he did probably at Arkansas when he had Sam Pittman as his offensive line coach. What he's going to be able to do is throw little passes because the Buckeyes are going to sit in, you know, in, in, in zone coverage, and he's going to be able to dip and dop and kind of what Tulsa did a little bit, take what they give you and keep his team on the field to keep this electrifying offense off the field. I know Mike Loxley is sleeping in a hotel tonight in Columbus. They're getting ready to go to bed in Columbus tonight going, dear Lord, please don't let this become a track meet because we don't have the speed to stay up with these guys. And they don't have the points rather to race up with them either. You know, um, First of all, let's let's take a second here to uh, applaud and appreciate that one. That was that was terrific uh, background information. But you nailed Talia Tungavailoa the first time it came out of your mouth in this podcast, which <laughs> is just worthy of of a moment in itself. So congratulations and well done. Um, uh, thank you. You know, and, and the one thing that's great about him, um, I've had the pleasure uh, of getting to really, um, really kind of know his story a little bit more. You know, June Jones was his high school football coach. He, he coached he and his brother at, at, at this little high school in, in Hawaii. They started calling to the mainland and goes, hey, guys, these guys are really special. I got these quarterbacks. And, and when June was at Hawaii, I mean, you talk about an incredible, incredible experience uh, for them to be able to do that and really set the world on fire with what they did Hawaii offensively. These guys, you know, June thought they were better than them. And when he said that, he gave them the opportunity and called out to everyone in the country. And these guys have come over here. Obviously, his older brother's doing, a, you know, when he stays healthy, is, is a really special player in the National Football League. And, you know, Talia has been really, really good uh, going forward. So um, I, I've got a lot of affinity for those guys. And, you know, hopefully they're not going to show up. Uh, Talia is hopefully not going to show up too strongly uh, tomorrow in Columbus. I didn't want to take too much attention away from that, but it felt like a necessary thing to, to point out. <laughs> I appreciate um, it. <laughs> uh, Dan Enos, though, back to, to that note, you know, um, I think if there's one thing that any Ohio State opponent uh, could take from the Buckeyes opener this year against Minnesota, it was that formula. You know, Minnesota is a very competitive, good Big Ten football team. They're going to win a lot of games. They've got some good talent. Obviously, it stinks that they, you know, have lost their star running back in that Buckeye game, you know, Mohamed Ibrahim. Um, but they outpossessed Ohio State. 42 minutes to 18 minutes and and still you know lost the game but they slowed the Buckeye offense down by literally keeping them off the field the problem was they gave up way too many home run plays and that was that so I'm sure schools like Maryland frankly I'm sure Rutgers probably felt last week like that was the way they needed to try to attack Ohio State we're not going to slow down this offense for Ohio State so keep them off the field as long as possible and, and find ways to just make the clock melt. Yeah, I mean, that's what they're going to try to do as they attack this team. And, you know, you're probably going to see more of Teon Fleet Davis than you've seen in the past uh, as for Maryland fans. Uh, they're running back. And then, you know, Petty Boone's another guy that's gotten some experience. He's a big back, 6'1", 245. You know, they might let him pound a little bit and let him try to run the football tomorrow. And really, like I said, try to eat up the clock as much as they can. Now, the biggest difference between the Maryland Terrapins and Minnesota, I think Minnesota is better up front on the offensive line side of the football. And I think also you're going to see a better quarterback tomorrow than Tanner Morgan. And I know sure. Tanner Morgan's going to be a great man game manager. And P.J. Fleck has maximized 
uh, what God, you know, mom, dad, and God gave Tanner Morgan. Uh, but I really think, you know, tomorrow with, you know, Talia, I mean, like, he's going to have to, he's going to have to step up. This is his big moment uh, to really make a statement, you know, not only for Big Ten play, but nationally for these guys, because uh, Maryland's going to be a bowl team. You know, they got four wins going into sure. this. They got to get a couple more. Uh, and, and kudos to Mike Loxley and his staff. Like, they've got this thing going a little bit more. He's hired some really good coaches. He's got Ron Zook running the special teams. Who, I mean, Ron Zook at one point was a head coach in the National Football League. So, I mean, he's got some really talented coaches on his staff, and they'll have a great game plan tomorrow, you know, for Ohio State. John Alexander pops in here and asks a quick question Do you think we're going to see more blitz packages now that the defense is improving? I do. I really do. I think that when the deep, when you blitz, you blitz because you're confident you can tackle in space. You know, the guys right down 71, who I, I know we don't want to talk about yet, but Luke Fickle's guys, they do a really nice job, the Bearcats, of playing man coverage, a lot of different exotic blitz packages because they can tackle in space. Ronnie Hickman's development gives you a little bit more of a, a sense of, hey, we can play some man and we know we can make some tackles in space. That's the biggest key. Teams that blitz are teams that are confident in the man-to-man -man tackling schemes that they have. If they can tackle, if the Buckeyes continue to tackle well, I think they'll continue to do that. I also don't think that Matt Barnes is going to get too far away from the Akron game plan. DJ Irons is probably the best. Akron's quarterback was the best athlete that they've played so far this year. And now, you know, having, you know, Talia, you know, tomorrow to have to contain him, I really think they're going to try to run those inside pressures again, the A-gap, B-gap blitzes that they did. So don't be surprised to see the Buckeyes blitz early um, as a way to try to kind of get him off, off schedule a little bit at quarterback. One of the things that we you know, have talked about before, and this is more so off air, well, Iowa was able to generate a lot of pressure up front. They did a nice job of getting after it and pinning their ears back. And, and really, I, I think tomorrow, Larry Johnson and his guys need to have a big game. They need to step up. You know, Maybe Zach Harrison's coming out game for the season to let you know why he's a captain and why he's such a celebrated player, not only in the locker room, but around the greater Columbus area. So if you see those guys kind of step up and play, it's going to open up Matt Barnes to keep blitzing more and really get an opportunity to get home and, and cultivate some more tackles for loss and more sacks that are going to be crucial to, to burying this Maryland offense. When Ohio State's got the ball, you know, last week, C.J. Stroud was an absolute rock star. Um, I don't know if there's a way to grade someone out as perfect or what that bar looks like. You know, he did throw six incompletions, but frankly, even the incompletions were good incompletions, right? They weren't overthrows over the middle of the field that somebody could have picked off. Uh, and frankly, I, I was almost as happy with that as I was the the vapor trail behind a lot of his throws. 17 of 23 for 330 and five touchdowns. The kid looked really, really good. Um, if he can back that up tomorrow by doing the same kind of thing, I think a lot of people are going to start taking notice because then he's got another week to get as as healthy as possible. Not that he isn't you know, hasn't made strides after taking that Akron game off. He clearly looked like a different kind of player, but if he could string two of those performances in, in a row together and go into the bye for, you know, what's going to be a really tough second half of the season against going into this week, a Penn State team that hasn't lost, a Michigan State team that hasn't lost, a Michigan team that hasn't lost, and if you're lucky, an Iowa team that hasn't lost. Um it's it, the next, you know, eight weeks are going to be awfully difficult for the Buckeyes. You need Stroud to keep looking like he did last week for sure. Yeah, he's got to start fast. He's got to get these receivers going. And, you know, what complements a great quarterback is a great run game. And I know a lot of people have waited with bated breath. Is Trayvon Henderson fully healthy? And I know I'm not trying to take away from your question here, Brendan, but Trayvon Henderson's health and his ability to start the running game early allows the Buckeyes to let C.J. Stroud settle in and have an outstanding game. And realistically, this Maryland defense is average. It's not the best defense in the country. They, they blitzed and they stunned and they twisted a bunch last week against Iowa and really couldn't do much. Iowa's a very basic offense. They run a couple different plays, uh, but they do it really, really well. C.J. Stroud, if he can set his feet tomorrow, uh, I should have a field day, being able to throw the football around the yard and really get an opportunity to, to continue his dominance uh, that, that we saw last week and the flashes we saw before with the shoulder injury uh, from that standpoint. The biggest matchup I'm looking for, you know, really is going to be, you know, up front. You know, Darrell Cammy, uh, the the Jack linebacker that they use, who's also a – they drop him into coverage. They use him as a defensive end and stand-up. He's probably their best pure pass rusher. He's about 6'4", 260. 
Um, he's going to have he's going to go at you know the tackles for Ohio State early. They're going to figure out ways to try to get him inside, maybe. Um, but one of the things that people forget, you have Thayer Munford and Paris Johnson inside. It's a pretty good pass protecting offensive lineman. So um, it's going to be an interesting, you know, interesting battle, uh, you know, from that standpoint. But but once again, I mean, if CJ starts off strong, it, it could be a really long day for Maryland. I know the wise guys, I think, have it at like 21. And the, like I, I always say, their pencils are really sharp. Uh, they're usually pretty pretty spot on with these things. Uh, they were not last week, but uh, but I think they're, they're kind of settling back in. And really, yeah, we're seeing a real Maryland team. I, I think if Maryland would have played better against Iowa without those picks, you're probably seeing a 10 to 13 point spread in this game just because of the fact Maryland would be coming into this game as a four and one team that, you know, looked a little bit better against a really talented Iowa team, but that's not the case tomorrow. Uh, this is a team that's reeling right now. They got to figure things out. And I, I know it's only one loss, but you know, tomorrow noon is going to be a great start. You know, when you're at home, it's a lot easier to get started. I think Maryland's going to struggle. They're going to have to get those guys up probably around six o'clock. They're going to activate them early. They're going to have them do different, cal- you know, their walkthroughs and meetings and, and different things to kind of get them generated and going. I mean, there's a good chance right now at 8.58 in the Eastern Standard Time Zone right now, those guys are probably asleep or, or encouraged to go to sleep right now uh, to try to get them going from that standpoint. Because the difference is you don't practice at noon. The Maryland right. Terrapins don't practice at noon. Ohio State doesn't practice at noon. The difference is Ohio State's staying in a hotel that they normally stay in. They're going to be eating the same food that they normally eat every single week on the road or, or at home. They're going back to playing in front of a fan base who's excited to see them play. And a pretty good chance that if they start fast, they're not going to hear the boos uh, that have serenaded them uh, last month. Uh, I, I think, first of all, I should say just off the top, uh, Travion Henderson, you know, just to, to clarify, yeah, of course, we are we're going to be keeping an eye on him early, but we have no reason to think that he's not healthy. Uh, last week, he, he had a couple of early carries. I think he finished eight carries for 70 yards or so uh, and obviously had the, the early touchdown. Got banged up in the first half. Ryan Day said that uh, he held him out of the second half. Coach's decision, it was not because Travion wasn't healthy. Uh, and then he backed that up on Tuesday when he was asked about Travion's health and said he's fine, he's good to go. So we are anticipating that Ohio State's running back, who was – uh, added to the watch list if you're into that kind of thing for the national uh, top national running back in the country. Um, you know, Travion's had a great year, and and he I think he deserves some of that consideration. Um, but I've also enjoyed his humility because he just he seems to have some big goals, but doesn't necessarily want all the attention. That's uh, that's a great thing. Yeah, um, Brendan, I and not to interrupt, but I, I I don't know if there's a running back in the country that's playing better football than Travion Henderson right now. I mean, he's if he's at if he's at another school right now. Let's just throw yeah. this into the equation. The way that he's running the football, let's put an average offensive line. He's got a good offensive line in front of him. I'm not taking that away from the Buckeyes. You put Trayvon Henderson on an average football team, Trayvon Henderson has more rushing yards than anybody in the country at this point, if that's the case. And it's probably true. The Buckeyes have been afforded the opportunity where they haven't had to lean on him. I know for the exception of the one record-breaking game, they've been able to kind of keep him out of the game with the, uh, the, the looming – uh, aforementioned schedule coming down the stretch here uh, for the mo- beautiful months of October and November. Let's talk about uh, that front seven for Maryland. When you've had a chance to watch them play, I re- again, I realize, you know, look, they, they pounded Howard. You know, a, a lot of the Power Five teams are going to have some of those schools on their schedule at this point. And so, um, you know, less in those games, but more in just general, when you've seen Maryland's front seven, why are they – perhaps the best front seven Ohio State has seen so far this year? Really, I think size and experience. When you look at this group, uh, you know, from, from the top bound, as, as you're going to attack these guys and looking at them, you know, it's really going to start with Amit Fanu, the, uh, the defensive tackle. He's 6'2". He's 320 pounds. He's played a lot of football for them. I'm sorry, Finau. He's played a lot of football for these guys. Um, you know, Greg Rose is another defensive tackle that rotates in with them. Um, he's another big guy. So they've got guys with experience. Um, they've got a they've got a grad you know they got a graduate at defensive end you know I, I already mentioned uh, Cammy the the kid that's a jack who does a really nice job he's his backup actually is a is a guy Lotez Rogers who's a, a senior as well so they're going to rotate those guys a lot to try to keep them fresh and try to keep them off those those linebackers who are young they've got sophomore linebackers and similar to kind of the situation Ohio State's in they're they're guys that are young they haven't played as much football as you'd like to see them play. Uh, but really, their defensive line, they're going to rotate these guys a lot. It's a, it's a veteran group. Uh, really, the youngest guy in the group is Anthony Booker Jr., who was uh, uh, you know, a Winton Woods kid from Cincinnati. He's the only kid on the roster from the state of Ohio. 
Um, he kind of, you know, bucked the trend by going out of the state. He did not have an Ohio State offer. Um, he was more so kind of a Mac, upper Mac guy, you know, maybe some lower group of five teams. And this was really his power five offer that he was able to jump in. Um, I also think if you play football in the state of Ohio, you get an offer from the University of Kentucky. I think he had an offer there as well. Um, so any kid in the state of Ohio has an offer from them, which is kind of <laughs> ironic. But he had the, um, you know, he, he bucked the trend and, and then go down to Lexington. He, he, you know, he went over to our nation's capital. But that being said, that front, that front four, and I say front eight because they're going to rotate those guys a bunch tomorrow to try to get them fresh, to try to find the right elixir. You know, similar to kind of Ohio State was at the beginning of the year, trying to discover who the right defensive linemen were to go attack these guys. They're going against the best offensive line. Really, they've played all year. And that that's a lot being said, considering they played Iowa last year, who Iowa is notorious for outstanding offensive linemen. I think right now the group that studs got up front, these guys are talented. I mean, Matt Jones is a backup on this team who could start at probably 90% of schools in the country right now. It's it's a, it's a really talented group. It's going to be a good battle in size. And if the Buckeyes can open up some seams and, and kind of play on the other side of the line of scrimmage early, um, it, it could be a long day for this group, and, and they'll be looking to the sideline asking who the next guy in is. If you're, uh, if you're watching live with us and you have questions along the way, please feel free to drop those in. We'd love to answer them for you. Uh, in the meantime, you know, it, it probably feels like the appropriate time now to, to bring this up defensively for Ohio State. Um, we've got enough of a sample size, I think, of these first three games since Matt Barnes took over the defensive play calling and Kerry Combs went upstairs. Uh, obviously, three wins for Ohio State. At the end of the day, that's good. But I do think Ohio State has played progressively better each of the last three weeks on defense, whether that's experience, you know, building up for some of these young guys whether it's just confidence, whether it's got something to do with the, the strength of schedule right now, or maybe, you know, components of all of it. Um, why have you seen, or maybe where have you seen is the better question, the, the specific instances of growth on the Ohio State defense that should leave you as a fan saying, hey, we got a fighting shot to, to still accomplish our goals this year. The same thing we complained about after week one, week two, and week three. Fundamentals. This defense is starting to play with fundamentals. They're knocking guys down. They're not letting people get extra yards after contact. They're making tackles. They're rallying to the football. They're playing better football. They're just playing a better brand of football right now. They're still not the best defense that Ohio State's had in, in recent memory, but it's a group of guys that are learning. They're literally getting better every week. And I know that sounds really cliche to say, but it's true. These guys are building sweat equity week in and week out playing against these teams. And the Buckeyes are fortunate because they have one of the most explosive offenses in recent college football history to complement them. So with, giving up 10 points, giving up 17 points, that's not the end of the world. They know, they know the offense has got their back, which is so encouraging for these guys. But that's really, I think, in my opinion, where you've seen them play a lot better. Also, the defensive line is starting to play with their hands again. And that was when we first, at the beginning of the year, Larry Johnson's guys are always really well coached. And LJ, the rush man, the, the guy that's got this whole thing rolling, he traditionally, you see these guys extend in, they're shocking it on these guys. They got away from that a little bit. You know, they try to work some more speed moves and different, you know, avoiding techniques. They're getting back to using their hands and they're getting back to playing on the other line of, you know, other side of the line of scrimmage. You know, you could omit the sacks that they generated against Akron off the, off the table, but they're still getting close to the quarterback and cultivating pressures that are leading to, uh, positive results in the second end, in the back end of this thing. So I think that's the biggest thing that you're seeing the Buckeyes improve. The linebacker play has gotten better. It's not there yet. They're still they're still ways away, but they're young and they're going to continue to get better. And, and fortunately, they're winning football games while they're doing this. And if they can continue to do that trend, you know, it could really, really create a, a good defense going forward into December. You talked about Ohio State's offense achieving at an extremely high level. Just to to punctuate that a little bit. Uh, the Buckeyes have the number one ranked total offense in college football this year, 556 yards per game. They are 22nd in the country in passing offense. I'm sorry, in rushing offense at 220 a game. They are ranked eighth in the country in passing offense at 336 yards per game. The idea that what C.J. Stroud did in two and I guess two quarters plus one drive last week. Uh, that's what Ohio State's passing offense is averaging during this first five games of the year. The Buckeyes have the number five ranked team passing efficiency, number four nationally ranked scoring offense at 45 points a game. I mean, they really have been extremely difficult to slow down, even the Oregon game. I mean, the Buckeye offense 
uh, you know, couldn't get off uh, or, or couldn't convert a couple of fourth downs, but they still racked up almost 600 yards of offense in that game. And they just, you know, they, they, they struggled a couple of instances in that game to convert fourth downs and keep drives going. Um, and then, you know, the other big stat, look, uh, this team right now is third in third down percentage at 55.2%. Um, a lot of that I think is because they've been in manageable third down situations First downs have been very good for the Buckeyes. I don't have the the first down numbers in front of me, but um, they're staying on schedule as an offense very regularly. And I don't care how good you are um, as a defense. If you're constantly trying to defend third and two, third and three, third and one, it's not going to work for very long. No, I mean, the percentages are against you in that favor. And, and, and from my days of coaching college football, you know, one of my favorite days of the week was third and two. And, you know, hey, we're third and short. We're second and short. Like when the coach goes, hey, we're going to have a competitive period. It's second and two. I'm pretty excited <laughs> about that. And every offensive coordinator in America gets excited about that. Sure. Because you legitimately have your entire playbook available. You go, oh, okay, we can go get that. We can go get this play. Or we can go run the ball, have a hurry up shot play right afterwards. You can call a shot play. And if you miss it, you're third and two. You got an opportunity to play for it. And one of the other things that the Buckeyes have really done well is, like you said, playing ahead of the schedule, but playing so confidently offensively. There's a confidence about this group where you see them look at each other and knowing that what they're doing is really special. And I'm glad that they're living in that moment. It's uh, it's similar to always you see the, the, the old um, meme of the guys on the office going, you know, how do you know you're not living in the good old times? Like, Buckeye fans, you're living in the good old times of this offense. You know, and they're still young enough that it's going to be good going forward. But this is a special group. It's a unique group. And there's some historic things going on right now in Columbus that we can be really excited about and celebrate that can continue to go forward tomorrow. And uh, it's, it's really going to be special uh, when you see this team hang another 50 or so plus on a, ooh, spoiler alert, on another Big Ten team <laughs> uh, going forward uh, tomorrow and, uh, and in the near future. All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Big Ten. So before we move away from Ohio State, since you have uh, kind of alluded to your prediction for the game, why don't we uh, why don't we go that direction next year? Um, I, uh, I'll let you go first this week. You made me go first last week. I've got mine written down in front of me, so I know what I'm picking. I'm not going to be influenced by you. What do you think? Okay. Buckeyes, 59, Terrapins, 20. 59, 20. I like that. Taking the over. Let's go. You know, the over has hit every time uh, in series history between Ohio State and Maryland, but this is the highest the over or the over under has ever been set at at 71. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I have selected, I'm pulling this up here because I it's it's written over on the website. You you can find it if you want, buckeyesnow.com. I'm not making it up. Hey, go uh, click that picked, button. Yeah. Uh, I said 5214. Um, I like Ohio State uh, offensively to, to get off to a good start. My semi-bold prediction, if you want to call it that, uh, I think Travion Henderson is going to have a pedestrian day tomorrow. Not a poor day. I just think he's not going to be the star of the show. He's literally averaging 9.4 yards per carry. That is bananas. <laughs> it's That is completely ridiculous. Um, I think tomorrow he averages like five and a half or six yards a carry, which is great. But it's not eye popping off the stat sheet. I think tomorrow is more about CJ Stroud. I think the Buckeyes are going to let it rip at home and they're going to get Stroud into a position where he feels really, really good going into the bye week. Um, I also think Ohio State will have more success passing it than running it against this Maryland defense. And because they are so talented at wide receiver, um, you know, Ryan Day likes to have balance. I don't think he's going to abandon the run at any point because. I don't think Maryland's going to put them in a position where they have to abandon the run, but I do think CJ Stroud is going to have a big day tomorrow. So I don't know how bold that is to, to say that Henderson is going to be at a, a far more earthly six yards per carry instead of nine plus, but that's what I got for you. A pedestrian six yards, which means you're second and four, which once again comes back and begs the question, Brendan, <laughs> if you hand the ball to Trayvon Henderson, Every two plays, you get a first down with that bold prediction. So I don't know how pedestrian it is. I guess it's going from 
you know, looking at like he went from being Superman to Batman. I mean, I, I don't know what the what the what you could say from that standpoint. Are those fighting words? Did you just rank Superman that far ahead of Batman? That's a I whole have different to. podcast. I, I mean, I have to. Batman only. <laughs> Batman's superhero power was that he was rich. Like that's the thing that made him Batman and vengeance. You know, I, I don't money and vengeance. I don't know how that becomes a uh, part of it, but uh, you know, Superman came from a different planet. Like he's, he's just different. And uh, you know, Trayvon Henderson, I think was born on earth, uh, but there was something, but special maybe not. The, there was something special <laughs> in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, when he, when he was created. Uh, but uh, the other thing to mention about that score, I also would love to see the defense come up with another pick six. Uh, I believe we're, we're working on three in a row right now. No, we've got this, three three straight right, weeks for the number pick four. six. And the first week of the season, Haskell Garrett, remember, had that scoop and score. So we've had four defensive touchdowns in five games. Right. And this is something that you'd love to see. Um, and I know I've, I've alluded to the stat before. It's almost like 80% more better chance of winning a football game if you score on the defensive side of the football. So I think that's important. Uh, if they can do that early, uh, it's going to it's gonna really get this fan base behind it, and it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. Got a couple of questions here. Neil yeah. Harris chimes in. Neil says, how many times average per game you think Stroud will run? As in tomorrow, a cold run or a, a uh, run? Well, I, I think uh, the way this is worded, it's a little bit vague, but I think uh, he's basically saying, look, on a, on a normal, everyday kind of, you know, every week uh, average, how, how often would you like to see C.J. Stroud using his legs? Four to five carries a game. It's about a quarter, a play a quarter. What it does is it forces the team to have to defend his own read. C.J.'s not a burner, but he does enough in the run game where if you don't honor him, he's going to take off and he can get 10, 15 yards on that carry. Um, and he's smart when he gets to the sideline. You know, he baits those guys. He can bite that little hit. They take that little hit on the sideline. Maryland, I think, is one, I believe, is one of the most uh, penalized teams in the Big Ten. So it's, they've been playing sloppy football, especially on defense when it comes to that. Uh, that, that tomorrow will be a good opportunity for him to maybe kind of lean there at the end of the sideline, maybe get another 15 or, um, you know, similar to what he did, uh, you know, earlier uh, earlier in the year or so. You know, something that you could see from there. But in my opinion, right now you've got this really good deep running back room, but that zone read is going to at least keep people a little bit softer going forward. Uh, and one of the things that the Buckeyes do to not force him to run as much, that's what RPOs are. RPO started as a zone read type deal. And we talked about the history of this with Joe Moorhead, uh, who, who we're keeping in our prayers right now. I know Joe's going through some stuff right now uh, up in Oregon. But one of the things you see is the RPO started as a way to not force your quarterback to run. It was a way for him to be able to do the same thing he was doing when he was reading that down defensive lineman and read a secondary player instead to open up the box. Because most defensive coordinators are going to add an extra guy to the box to force you to do something, to read some component of it. Uh, so you can't just line up and go man on man and, and just go run the football. Makes a ton of sense. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. <laughs> you laugh like I like that went way over my head. It, it, you know, re it registered on a base level. I, got I love you. it. Hey, there's some element of football is a man on man game, right? If you got more guys blocking than they got guys that can tackle, you got a pretty good chance to move the ball. And if they got way more guys that can tackle than you have guys blocking, it's going to be tough for you to move the football. It's, Absolutely. it's, uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's a, there's a definite numbers game in, as part of this. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, as excited as we are for Ohio state and Maryland, there's a heck of a game in Iowa city tomorrow that big 10 football fans better be paying attention to. Um, I don't know if I'm willing to call this a playoff elimination game, but the team that wins is going to be in a fantastic spot. The team that loses is going to have a real uphill battle. If I, I think Iowa can absorb a loss more than Penn State can because Iowa doesn't have the same exact kind of difficult schedule in front of it. The West is a lot less challenging this year, shall we say, than the East. Um, if Penn State loses tomorrow, I think it could be really, really tough for them. But – the Big Ten is proving, as you look at the national rankings right now, the Big Ten is certainly showing that they are for real this year. And whoever wins the Big Ten championship, I put this out earlier this week, even if it's the Buckeyes with one loss, the winner of the Big Ten championship has an extremely good chance to make the college football playoff. That's not just you know conjecture. Literally on ESPN's playoff prediction tool, 
If Ohio State wins out and wins the Big Ten Championship, they're a 98% likelihood to get in the playoff. If the Buckeyes lose to Penn State or Michigan, but still somehow if things work out that they can get to the Big Ten title game and win the Big Ten, even with two losses, the Buckeyes in that instance would be a 78% chance to make the college football playoff. And it's because of how challenging the schedule is. You're going to have some really, really good wins if you're Ohio State because you've got to play Penn State and Michigan and very likely Iowa in order to get to the college football playoff. So all that said, to set up a matchup with a Hawkeye defense that is really, really good and a Penn State team that has showcased at times some pretty darn impressive play. Veteran players on both uh, both teams, veteran quarterbacks on both teams. Um, I am very excited to, to keep an eye on this game. I think Iowa is going to win, but I think it's going to be really tight. I agree 100% with you, Brendan. I, you know, I'm looking at that game. Iowa is playing the best football they've played under Kirk Ferentz in, in almost a decade. Penn State is playing the best they've played in the Tony Franklin era. And tomorrow they're going to be up for this game. They're going to be ready to play. Iowa's an electrifying atmosphere. Anybody that's ever been to a game there, it's it's a special place. Um, it's not Ohio State. Ohio State's kind of on a different level. Ohio State and Michigan, I hate to say that out loud, are, are in different levels. And then Penn State for a whiteout. Those are probably the three best venues, um, if you will, in the Big Ten. And I'm a little biased on that. But tomorrow at Iowa, it's going to be a tough game. Um, I, I like Iowa. I like Iowa 17-14. to 14. And the reason I say that is this. I just think that Iowa's defense – is going to come to play. Penn State's defense is really talented. Uh, they've got great linebackers. They, they play fast. They play aggressive. And, and they play a fun brand of defensive football. I, I really think at the end of the day, though, I, I just think Iowa's just too got too much going for them right now. They're a tough team to beat, especially at home. And I think Kirk Ferentz is going to have this team ready to kind of make that note. This is going to be a big point for Penn State because they lose this game tomorrow. And I know, statistically speaking, you go, what's their first loss? They're out of the Big Ten Championship game. They're out of it. I mean, they're out of it because they're out of the, actually the college football playoff and they're going to end up losing to Ohio State. I can promise you that if they lose tomorrow, because it's just the way the culture is cultivated. They're not a team with a lot of resiliency. They've historically, any time that they lose, it lingers on. It, it hurts this team and it's continued to do that um, the entire time that Tony Franklin has been at Penn State. So this is a big, big game for them. Um, it also could dictate whether or not Tony Franklin packs his bags Franklin. and goes out west the u.s uh J james franklin sorry james franklin yes yeah, sorry got yeah. all excited about him sorry i was i was thinking <laughs> of tony franklin the old offensive coordinator but uh yeah but james franklin yes i mean it could be him packing his bags and going out west i've got uh iowa 24 penn state 21 uh the spread right now is is a point and a half in favor of iowa the over under is 41 i don't know and and i will say this telling you please don't take betting advice from me i've literally never bet on a game in my life it's not my thing but when I've paid attention to it, I don't know why I feel like the under on college football. If you're betting the under, you got a death wish. <laughs> I just feel like the game is so offensive. I, I would have a really hard time ever betting an under. Uh, so that's why I picked 24-21, but I do think it'll be a tight game. Um, there is one other game that Ohio State fans really need to be paying attention to tomorrow. It's not a Big Ten game. But it's one of the teams the Buckeyes would need to, to sneak past. The Red River rivalry between Oklahoma and Texas renews tomorrow. Uh, that's down in Dallas in the Cotton Bowl. And Oklahoma ranked number six in the country. They are undefeated, despite the fact they've looked extremely beatable, with the exception of their walloping win over Western Carolina. Their other four wins have been by seven points or less. They have not scared anybody. Texas has lost to Oklahoma now three years in a row, and Texas has sort of been kicked around a little bit. They've lost 15 of the last 22. Um, Texas is four and one. I think their Big Ten, or Big Ten, I think their Big 12 championship hopes suddenly feel a little bit more real now that they look up north and, and see an Oklahoma team that's not quite as dominant. Um, all this talk in the preseason about Spencer Rattler going to be a, a Heisman candidate and everybody's comparing him to the quarterbacks before him at Oklahoma. He's like kind of fighting to keep his job right now. He really hasn't played very well. 
So I think Texas is going to beat Oklahoma tomorrow. And if, if you're a Buckeye fan, you can't ignore that game. I agree with you. Uh, last year, we were blessed. That it was like, it was like a four overtime game or five. I mean, it was a ridiculous yep. game. And, and Texas was just not good last year. Uh, they struggled with a lot of football. Um, and Sark's come in. He's done a phenomenal job. He's They're playing really good offense. He's empowered the quarterback to really run and, and do stuff. And, 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 he didn't have the team ready to play Arkansas earlier in the year. Now, Arkansas is a decent football team, and you could say, well, they got blown up by Georgia. Everyone gets blown up by Georgia. Georgia's really good. Um, but he's – you're looking at a Texas team that I think is going to come into this game with a lot to prove. Oklahoma's so sick of hearing the noise, though. They're so sick of it. And Spencer Rattler right now is sick of hearing the fan base chanting what's going on. Um, it's going to be in the middle of the Cotton Bowl, which is one of the college football's best rivalry games. I like Texas – close really close in this one i think i think oklahoma comes back in this one to make it interesting i think texas jumps out early i think oklahoma plays catch-up football tries to make it close at the end even to the point where they have a field goal attempt at the end that they could go win it with and somehow don't make that happen i'll take texas close and now the longhorn fan base starts thinking again are we what we thought we were going to be uh when they hired steve sarkeesian i uh I like most of what you said. I'm taking Texas 41-28. I don't think it's going to be that close, although I think Oklahoma will have the ball late in the game down by that margin with a chance to try and make it close, and I think Spencer Rattler is going to throw a pick uh, late in the game. Texas comes up with a, a big turnover late. That's my uh, that's my thought on that. So I, I think Texas will uh, – I mean, look, I don't think it's going to be a blowout by any stretch, but – a two touchdown win is a fairly comfortable margin, especially for a team that in recent years has not played very well in that rivalry game. So I, uh, I like Texas in this game and, you know, maybe that's rooting a little bit with your heart more than your head, but I, um, I think Texas in the last couple of weeks, I've seen some highlights, you know, they certainly look a heck of a lot better than they did last year. Um, and, and I, I just have a hunch that they're going to, they're, they're going to play well this weekend. Yeah, what a process, you know, you could be hundred percent right on that. I, I think Spencer Rattler, though, I really do. I think they're sick of hearing the noise. This, this team's run counter to death. They're really good at it. They're replacing these, all these offensive linemen that went to the National Football League. Oklahoma's offense is a little bit better than they've shown. And people go, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. You, you have to play to prove what you are. I think tomorrow this game means a lot to them. That's the only reason I think they keep it close um, and get an opportunity to, you know, maybe, I don't want to say scare Texas, but, but keep it closer than a lot of the wise guys think it's going to be. I love it. Can we ask a really serious question? Absolutely. Give us give us the uh, the details, the background on the T-shirt, because you are usually a collared shirt guy, but this is there is some strength in your T-shirt game right now. Well, I, I two shout outs. One goes to our friends at Homage. You know, Homage obviously in Columbus is a great T-shirt company, but I'm repping the Buckeye Donut shirt. And for Buckeye fans that are watching this, and this is not a paid advertisement. They did not call us. They didn't ask. No us. free ads. They're open twenty four seven, three hundred sixty five days a year. They make a donut and a croissant called a cronut that's really hard to find in a lot of different markets. It's ridiculously good. If it's covered in chocolate, stay away from it. It's just the original one. That with a chilled Smith's, uh, Smith's chocolate milk there and around 2, 30, 3 o'clock on High Street can be really, really nice. Uh, maybe tomorrow after a victory, it'd be a nice celebratory. <laughs> uh, dip it in there or whatever uh, to go with it. So my, my daughter uh, loves looking at cartoon characters on my T-shirt, so... Uh, usually it's either the Macho Man Randy Savage or uh, this one here, which is kind of a Brutus knockoff, uh, holding up a great donut uh, that hopefully will be the amount of turnovers the Buckeyes have tomorrow. <laughs> well done. Well done. Well, it's been fun. And uh, I think we're looking forward to it. You know, an Ohio State team right now that feels like they've got a lot going for them. Ryan Day made it pretty clear this week. He thinks this team looks an awful lot different now compared to where they were at the beginning of the season. The defense is playing better playing with more confidence. The offense right now is coming off their best game of the year, uh, and that was after coming off a game where they scored a bunch of points and got a lot of guys some playing time. Um, we're starting to see an Ohio State team that has that look and feel to Ohio State football, what what you know and love after a couple of uh, frustrating weeks. Um, as we move forward, it, it certainly appears like a loss to Oregon won't be – uh, enough to knock the Buckeyes out of the college football playoff if they can handle their business the rest of the way. They just don't have any wiggle room. So uh, sometimes when you have your back against the wall, that's when you 
you put all the cards on the table and, and you give it your best shot. I think Ohio State has uh, a chance tomorrow with Maryland coming to town to, to do just that. Uh, and by the way, if you're watching the game tomorrow, whether you're in person or watching at home, um, be nice to your, your favorite TV broadcaster or radio broadcaster or public address announcer who has to try to pronounce the names on this Maryland roster because <laughs> they are next to impossible. There are probably 10 names that have at least five syllables and, and lots of consonants that don't usually go next to each other. So you might hear some different names pronounced several different ways throughout the course of the game. Uh, we're going to give it our best, but just know that if you're watching the game on TV and you're not a Maryland fan, you're like, man, he said that guy's name like three different ways. It's probably because it could be said three different ways. <laughs> yeah, whoever's calling the game tomorrow right now is sitting in a mirror in, in, in a Marriott right now. Tagovailo, Tagovailo. I mean, like you're going through this whole – <laughs> I mean, and, and kudos to that coaching staff for recruiting – uh, these guys, when you pick up that phone as a, as a recruiter, and a lot of you probably have never had to do this, or some of you work in sales, and you see a name, and and you look back into it, and you make that call, and you're like, hey, uh, is – well, anyways, this is Kami Zagorski. How are you? you know, <laughs> it's one of those types of situations uh, where you hope that they kind of open up a little bit about it. Um, I've been in plenty of recruiting meetings like, what's this kid's name? <laughs> what's, he go by? what's mom's name what's dad's name so um hopefully uh those guys tomorrow will be able to not play too much hopefully that's more of a focus going in later in the game where the broadcasters are, are calling a buckeye blowout and have nothing better to do than talk about the different syllables that they have to enunciate on national tv the uh the the legendary radio voice of the terps johnny holiday has been there for over four decades i'm sure he's got some semblance of it nailed down because he's around the team but uh i just looked it up aaron goldsmith who is an awesome play-by-play -play announcer who does some work on Fox. He's also the TV voice of the Seattle Mariners. He's done a lot of college sports over the years. He's got the uh, he's got the dubious duty tomorrow of trying to figure out how to get all this out and and spit it out cleanly. So, anyways, I just thought that'd be kind of fun. You're going to notice some names tomorrow that they're going to pop up. You're the starting lineup cards in the bottom of your screen. <laughs> Who are these guys? <laughs> are you predicting that Jim Lachey tomorrow is going to stay away from these names with a, with a yes. 10-foot pole? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love you if you're listening. I, I really hope you stay away from it. Uh, you know, let, let the voice Paul Keels decide the names of the voices of the play -play -play here in Buckeye Stadium. So. Uh, too funny. For Tommy Zagorski, I'm Brendan Gulick. Thanks for joining us tonight, our preview and prediction podcast of Ohio State and Maryland. We've got lots of great coverage. We'll have a live streaming instant analysis show. You can join us post-game tomorrow. Please do. We want your comments. We want your questions. We'll have a lot of fun with you after the Ohio State Buckeyes play Maryland tomorrow at the shoe. We'll have lots of written coverage over on Buckeyes now, so you can follow us there as well and uh, stick around for all of our social media content, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I think I've plugged everything there. We'll and see you again have, tomorrow. And even Buckeye day. Donuts. So. <laughs> and yes, and clearly the Cronuts down at uh, at Buckeye Donuts. So we'll see you guys, uh, see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for joining us here on a Friday night. We've got the whole crew together as we cover Ohio State with our instant analysis from Ohio State. There's something that doesn't feel right. Unbelievable effort from him today. Is EJ Liddell going to crack the first team all Big Ten? I think he can be the guy. I'm not trying to start a quarterback controversy. He seems to have the durability. He certainly has the toughness. This is the question on a lot of people's minds here. Welcome to Buckeye Breakdown.